Uh, welcome to the third of our writing rooms uh, at this year's ATF. Uh, session today on playwrights writing time. Um, my name is Tim Rosen, I'm the artistic director of Playwriting Australia and I've had the privilege of being in the room with all of these extraordinary writers and new play workers over the last um, three days and it's been completely uplifting. Um, over the last three days we've been trying to look at actually the, the, the business of writing plays, how we do the things that we do and what are the factors that we juggle and manipulate and, um, and explore in the, in the business of writing new work for the stage. Uh, on day one we looked at place, the locations within a play and uh, uh, surrounding a play. Yesterday we looked at space, the, the physical environment in which that work might exist. And today we look at time. Um, writing time, uh, as with all of these titles, they're designed to have many, many different levels of interpretation. The time in which you write, how you manage your time as a writer, the, uh, the treatment of time within the work, and I hope again that today we'll be able to touch on all of them as we go. Can I remind uh, or introduce, for those of you who haven't been here yet, that we very, very much want this to be a conversation. Please, at any point, join in, take issue with something, ask a question, throw, um, throw a grenade. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's all the more interesting and I think less nerve-wracking for our panel. Uh, which, which leads me on to um, today's group of exceptionals. Uh, Leah Purcell, as featured in Rhoda Roberts' talk just now. Oh. Actor, director, singer and playwright. Donna Abella, playwright Chivu, writer and uh, live performance artist. And Peter Matheson, dramaturg, one-time playwright. Um, Senior of Australian theatre. <laughs> elder. Well, elder. Yes. Wizened. Wizened. Yes, yes. yes. I'll accept wizened. Good. Um, my first question for, for all of you, really, and, and anyone else, is. Uh, um, <laughs> is that you have various factors in your toolbox as a playwright, various elements that you get to control and make choices about to increase or decrease the dramatic potential of your work. Um, I was hoping that you might give us some examples of moments in your work where you think you really successfully use time to create dramatic tension or to create a, an intervention in the work. Go on, Donna, over. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I'm not... Uh, my relationship to time as a writer is that I'm not interested in, in linear time. Plot, for me, is the least interesting part of playwriting. Um, so I'm not interested in, like, you know, a, a, you know chronologies necessarily. Um, and so I suppose the, the, the example is... Uh, the latest example is Jump for Jordan, which was on the Griffin last year. Um, and so what I did in terms of... Um, that whole play is an intervention in time because the, that play was... The structure of that play was like an archaeological dig. Um, so the strata, the linear strata of time had been disturbed uh, and so all of the layers had collapsed in on each other. And so that play, uh, the canvas of that play was... Um, was 30 years of family history um, was collapsing in on each other. So, so the first scene, the opening scene, for example, there's there's three characters and they're in three different time spheres and they're all yelling at different people uh, about the same thing, but at different times along the trajectory of the, the you know the inciting incident of the story. So, um, so I I kind of disturb time all the time in my plays um, because I'm not interested in because you know, because of notions to do with you know like realism for example and um, and you know the conventional like st linear storytelling which kind of privileges individuals you know mm. hero journeys heroes journeys and that kind of thing um, I'm more interested in kind of like uh, c c communal story and shared story and so and writing beyond the individual and so time has to collapse time has to um, be shared and also too I'm interested in um, uh, the fact that uh, I'll bring I have I'm speaking I'll talk, but I'm interested in notions of um, Walter Benjamin has a quote which I couldn't find but, but he, he basically talks about how linear time belongs to the victors and people who you know have been trounced by history or oppressed or whatever time for them is um, interrupted and disrupted and so like like trauma I'm interested in trauma as kind of a, a space to write write from, right about. Um, 
characters who kind of have been you know, oppressed or whatever, they live out of time. They're still dealing with unresolved, you know, with ghosts, with people from the past, the undead, um, and things like that. So I'm interested in, in out of timeness crashing into linear time. And I'll stop there. Okay. Peter, so you? I was going to leap in there. Go on. I, I need to talk about definition of realism. Mm. Uh, because <coughs> I'm a fan of naturalism, which is absolute replication of real events in time i.e. you do have them go to the toilet rather than cut scenes. I quite like that as, a, a, as an ideal, but essentially the problem with it is that it is ultimately terribly boring because you get every single bit of it. So, you know, in my head, realism is an attempt to increase dramatic tension by cutting out the bits that are boring so that, you know, ultimately you have as a, a chance to tell the story that you want to tell in an interesting fashion and in an interesting way. Chronology bores me shitless too. Sorry, that was a full stop, new topic. <laughs> um, probably because uh, I'm more interested in get, cutting to the chase all the time. You know, I want a play that starts at five minutes to midnight rather than at two o'clock in the afternoon and have eight hours of time to get to, get to that point. And so, you know, yes, that use of time I think is terribly important. Full stop. Right. Oh, well, I was just listening to Donna. I'm here to learn too. And I guess I, me, um, sometimes when I look at time, I just go, that's a pretty date. <laughs> you know, I don't really think about it too much either, but I'm just thinking about my work. Like with Box of Pony, it was flashbacks, it was present, it was past. When I think about Black Chicks talking, which was really interesting in hearing you, um, was that, yeah, we sort of broke time too, because it was all of a sudden we were in a spiritual world. We were in every woman, how that play opened was each woman was doing a monologue, but they were in their own time and space. Um, and I just think that. And with my next play, um, Drover's Wife, um, that was the pretty date of 1898. Um, but that was just something in relation to Henry Lawson when he wrote the book, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, um, I don't really like to think too hard about all that technical stuff, I guess. And I think that's when I bring my plays to you, and you tell me what what time they're in and where they need to be. Um. <laughs> so Tim. Like, yeah, so Tim. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I'm, yeah, I'm not a stickler for the rule either. And, uh, and I, it was interesting hearing you because I went, oh, okay, made me analyse my work. <laughs> no, no, okay. So I do jump around and just wherever the story needs to be, I guess. I don't pigeonhole myself to one style. Mm. Um, Peter and other experts in Australian theatre history, I'd, I'd love to just spend a couple of minutes looking through how our treatment of time might have evolved on the stage in in. Thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I'd you can't like, just I'd like to hand that use. ball to somebody else. Um, well, it seems to me in the 70s we were doing a different sort of uh, uh, theatre that uh, we do now. Uh, there was a lot more um, lack of realism. I think there was a really strong Commedia dell'arte um, influence in Australian theatre back then where it was all about performance rather than about truth although when you put that against you know things like the doll you know there's a very strong sense of realism that goes through it as well I mean it's hard to pick sorry I mean you know I might laughingly talk about neo-absurdism there for a moment about how the you know the individual now is still caught in the in the uh, in an inimical world as it was in the 1950s with the existentialists and uh, the bomb over the top of it and I mean I think that's a very strong influence in Australian theatre still you know where where a crazy world exists that the individual is attempting to wrestle with mm. I haven't got an answer for you I'm sorry pretty good start does anyone else want to try it no. Go on. John? Yeah. Mark? <laughs> so some, some of that was a bit technical. So I know, I yeah. apologise. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. I think that, you, know, you can trace all sorts of experiments through all sorts of different yeah. and, and almost all really interesting flies of female. We, don't, we still don't remember. Yes, true. You know. Um, well, we do. It's just that they don't get put on. Yeah, that's absolutely mm. true. But, you know, from Catherine to Zach Richard, kind of through. Oriel Gray. Yeah, or, uh, right. Jennifer Compton. Yes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, hang on, you know, all these. Anyway, I, I think it's, yeah, if you're interested yeah, in those writers, exactly. you want to find them because they're all doing individual things and they're all doing individual experiments yeah. in like, you know, complete localised chamber kind of time, mm. lyrical time, you know, dramatic time, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, this beautiful manipulator of time. You know, the church of kind of 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And all these guys will be forgotten. And I, I think any of that stuff comes back to us. Is she still writing? Does anybody know? Yeah, she's still writing. Yeah, she's still writing. Yeah, she's still writing. Is she still writing? Does anybody know? Mm. Yeah. But you know, the stuff that she was doing later was, although it was two times time frames, tended to be realism that's true. within there. Mm. Mm. And that that's the interesting thing is, too. Is, is time attached to a metaphor then as well? Like, Go on. Know, now it's the abandoned metaphor. Oh, and with that, with that great quote, but I wonder if that's attached to content and form on stage. Uh, I, I, I've written um, work where time is a character. Um, so I find that because um, what Donna was saying about um, stories that involve trauma, unresolved issues, ghosts, etc. Um, yeah, in, in two of my different works, it's a character talking to a character called Time that, you know, is in my mind a kind of perfect moment in his youth that um, he's having a discussion with. So, um, it yeah, it allows for a sense of reflection, but you can just read it as as two characters who are used to be in love. Mm. Oh, that one was, um, hang on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because there were two, so I'm, I'm kind of going on. Um, well, there's the dead twin, and so the dead twin is a metaphor for the past. Um, and then Ban Chung, there, there's the third story, is a conversation between the lover and time. We're going to come on to Bunchy in, in a little bit, so I'm going to ask you to sort of talk us through that in a second. But before we get there, Leah, I wanted to talk um, about the differences that you perceive between the kind of the standard white treatment of time and how time functions differently in Indigenous storytelling. Oh, fuck. Um, and any, anyone else in the room who's at any point? I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's a hard one to answer when, yeah, you, yeah, when you talk about a play that's based on an emotional journey rather than a than a than a standard journey, which is you know what Box the Pony is. You know yeah. where you where you're getting stronger and stronger emotions, but it it's you know written oh, that's only twenty years ago, and now it, you know this is five years in the future from that. It's it's harder to do that. I mean you know it's yeah. like saying you know is there, is there curry time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So everything starts twenty minutes later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, pro probably not. I mean, no, that thing of clock tick 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 is you know uh, relatively there. But there's certainly, um, and I've been in Australia for two years, and so I, I've been, you know, I'm starting from a very, 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 very late point. But the the relationship that. Uh, that the white Anglo culture has with the past and uh, and what that means to time feels very different to a sense of a living inhabited time in indigenous culture. Well, certainly the times that you and I have talked about this and the Remy and I have talked about it. Yeah, I, I guess I've never looked at it in that theory of relating it to time. It just is, mm -hmm. I guess. That's why I can't, I don't know if I could answer that question. I yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's what I laughingly call Nana Nunu. Um, it's a spiritual, uh, understanding of the world that that white culture has less of than an Aboriginal culture does, mm. and so therefore time is a, is something that's I think more elastic in in that culture than than in ours. Yeah, because we tend to confine the world by time. Um, so sorry, and she, yeah. yeah. I, I guess my observation of um, Aboriginal artists' work is the the sense of depth and length of time that, that's there, you know, 40,000 years, 60,000 years, that's, um, <laughs> that's that's just a really deep and long amount of time. Does it depend on the story being told? Yes, of course. Like, you know, Jack Davis works fairly linear and fairly traditional and mm. form if you really want because the story he's trying to tell about a family um, around a kitchen table and, you know, I think it, it's very specific to, or if you're telling a personal story or a solo or... Um, seven stages of grieving, really, really different, mm -hmm. you know, structure defines a concept of, of time. So it's very much the kind of story you're wanting to tell and the way you're wanting to tell it that then affects how you use time, surely. Without question, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So in, in Box the Pony, you <coughs> chose a, a narrative that has you in the present and the, the narrative in the past. And how do, how do you... We very rarely talk about actually how we how we write and about how we make the plays we do, and I'd love if we can to just slightly unpick craft for a second because it feels like the 
the great unspoken a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. But how do you how do you identify beyond instincts, and this is a question for everyone, the, the moments that you wanted to pick in that play? How do you there was a there was a lot of talk over six weeks mm -hmm. and and um, collaborating with the other writer it was something that we both, I sat down and would talk about one subject forever and I might spend 30 seconds on something and then we sort of, when we sat down we said what's going to make great theatre? Yeah. So it was, you know, well, what story, what can we, you know, how can we hook this in to make this happen with some dramatic peaks and, mm. and so it was just, it was just, yeah, it was just, it was just a collaboration of conversation of back and forth and what we think would make um, great theatre but also, um, I said being, um, people needed to understand where I came from because it, for those who don't know it was about a chick that gets on um, Galaxy Pay TV, the first video jockey, uh, she's got straight teeth, she's looking groovy but underneath all that she came from a grandmother who was part of the Stolen Generation, a mother with a drinking problem. So to understand her in the present we had to go back and incorporate those and as Indigenous as an Indigenous person, I am a part of my grandmother's dreaming. I'm a part of my mother's dreaming, which allowed me to have my dreaming. Yeah. So, so I I could not do my play without having them there behind me in some form. Whether it was a, you know it could have been a spiritual element at some time through the play. If I wasn't didn't feel that it was necessary that we needed to tell those stories. At the time it was very political. It was on the political agenda for stolen generations. Mm. So it was something of you know, not that I, because I never analyse anything, I just tell my yarns, you know, and then other people come and analyse and go, oh, that, that actually, you can tick that box, that box, that box, it's politically put in, oh, no, shit, well, it wasn't planned, I just wanted to tell the story. Um, so then, you know, that which allowed us to do flashback, do present, mm -hmm. be, be a commentary on social issues, living in Wallara, you know, all of that sort of, that sort of stuff. But that's, yeah, it was just, yeah, lots of talking and then, and then working out what would, what would make great theatre? Because that's what I wanted first and foremost. I said because I, I was being, I was, I wanted to act. I'm, you know, a lot of my writing at the moment is driven by being the actor. Yeah. And no one's going to write me a fucking lead role, so I've got to, I've got to work. <laughs> so it was an opportunity. It was the first time down in Sydney. Um, every other black fellow was working except for me. And then I went to Rhoda, bless her, and had to a barbecue, and I said. I'm, I'll clean a toilet, can I be a part of this festival? And she said, oh, you tell a good yarn, go write your own. And I said, you're joking, can't even spell, you know. Um, and then, and then I, I got up. So a lot of that was driven about a vehicle for me as a performer. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the story came out and, you know, I was quite naive to the process of, of the impact that it, that it had and where, 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 it took, where it took me. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of swearing and throwing chairs and mm -hmm. threw a first draft out the door and said how the fuck can I play 15 people <laughs> you know I thought it was a one woman show you know but um you know all of that sort of stuff and then you know of course what we're showing you tell oh, oh okay so yeah which is which is great which makes the process awesome because what we were trying to get to each one director the co-writer we just wanted the best because I said I want my non-indigenous audience to feel safe to come to my play because they're not they're gonna be ninety nine percent of the people that are gonna buy my tickets mm. and are gonna fill my houses. And it was really interesting the psychology of how because at those times there was a lot of indigenous plays that were a bit more about political issues and and putting the truth on, on stage where a lot of the audience were intimidated by it. So when I come out punching a boxing bag they were just petrified. And I said, G'day and mate you just the energy was amazing. Mm -hmm. Just all, oh great, she's not going to hit us over with anything, <laughs> you know. And we went on this amazing, you know, amazing journey. You know, well, for them, you know, me as an actor, I didn't know what I was doing, but you know, I just knew that I was moving people, and 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 it was an amazing um, feeling in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. And then to know that I'm sharing my stories, which whether it was the domestic violence, you know, people it changed people's lives. I would get letters. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but I guess, yeah, as a writer, I just wanted it for a vehicle. And I learned heaps. I was very, very new to the process. I think I won a competition when I was 12, but <laughs> other than that, you know, so. Um. Thank you. And can I, can I come in on that, the, the question you asked, Leah, which, or all of us, which was um, something about, like, in, in terms of craft, like, what makes us choose the things that yeah. we end up writing? So when I'm structuring a play, um, there is, I suppose, three main things that make me choose the scenes that I tell. And one is, you know, one is, you know, the logic, you know, the, the, just simple plotting, you know, this has to happen in order for this to happen. So there's, yeah. there's sort of, you know, lo causality, logical causality. 
Then for me, there's also associative cause causality. Because I sort of write in layers, then there's often you know, a scene that'll happen that might be in time five years ago that triggers something in a scene that's happening now. And it might be a word. And so a word from one scene from another time triggers an, an association in a new scene, which then triggers something else, which you know, might be a third scene entirely. Mm. But what's happening is that it's, it's language driven and so I work with associations that are driven by language and, 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 and metaphors that kind of extend and unroll. So there's, there's that way of creating a play as well. And so both of those are woven into my play. And there's also something that Maria Irene Fornes talks about, which, and I, I wish I had the quote here, but she talks about something about the, the, the necessity. Like, you know, you, you don't, it, 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 it probably can't work, but you write it anyway. You just, you just know in your guts and your bones that you have to write that. And there's a scene in Jump for Jordan where uh, the main character is imagining her girlfriend driving a truck in the desert. She is in the, uh, driving a truck in the desert, but she's got no contact with her. The girl driving the truck in the desert meets the main character's dead father at, at a roadhouse in the desert. Now, it is completely implausible, and there was pressure to have that scene removed because people were saying, the audience isn't going to go with you. But it just... It, it was right. It was absolutely right. Psychologically, the play needed the main character to learn, discover, whatever, whatever came out of that scene. And people loved that scene. People went with that scene. But I had to absolutely, you know, my reputation was on the line with that scene, you know. And so, right. so they're the kind of three bases on which, that's how I craft my, my sure. stuff. Thank you. Um, Chi, did you want to trip on this? Yeah, I, I think... Um, it's quite intuitive and based on, um, for each project, what I'm trying to do with that project. So very early on, I, I wanted, this is very early on, and, and you read that script um, a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I know. Where, uh, where I wanted the um, two audiences to come together, two different linguistic audiences to come together. So I, I wrote it in a bilingual way. So sometimes it would be, I'd be speaking in Vietnamese, for example, and this other character would be speaking in English. And, and so the audience just understood from half the conversation what was going on. And what was fascinating about that was when the audiences came, there would be kind of recognition or laughter of when a certain joke was in one language, but the other group was like, what, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And then other times it would be kind of the other way around. So this, so for me, it was like bringing together these two groups in a moment in time. And that, I think that was uh, um, the, the thing that only theater could do rather than you know writing a short story or something like that. So that, that was one kind of approach. And then another approach, it's, it's like, oh, I want to write three stories all set on the same night but in different time periods but how do I unite that in a way that is satisfactory and non-linear mm. and how do you and everyone how, how do you within the lives of your character you have from their birth to their death and anything that you might want to do either side of that how what's your process for kind of isolating that the time structure that you have is the most effective way to explore the narrative you want to explore. You could give us an hour from you know 10.38 to 11.38, or you could give us from age seven to age 42. How do you road test um, beyond instinct that, that that's, the, that's the method? Well, if you're Edward Albee, you have got a process. Sorry, I'll leave it there. You can work that out for yourself. <laughs> He used to put them in different positions and times and places and road test them, you know, and he never wrote his actual script until he'd actually road tested that character in that situation through different times and places. Does anyone here do that? Anything, no. Anything close to it? <laughs> it's an awful lot of effort. I know energy, it's isn't it? Work, yeah. But, you know, he writes good plays. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> things for me about time in the theatre is the fact that there's two times rolling against each other. There's the actors and the audience sitting in that yeah. moment of time yep. and they're all saying, well, let's pretend it's 1964, but of course it isn't. Yes. And every night it unrolls in the present moment mm -hmm. but returns back to the time they're pretending it to be. And I always hold that in my mind, the fact hard to put into words, but it's helped me understand my little game I play with myself when I'm sitting and writing the mm. play. I'm imagining it unrolling 
mm. night after night, mm. two years mm. away. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I, I know it's like a children's play, you know, they're out in the back garden getting the bits of wood and the taps from the rubbish pile and making a house and agreeing upon, and this is the doorway and this is where we've got the tap. But it, no matter what time period you're using in play, it's always in the present moment. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think that, oh, well, mm. I would like that to be the case. I, I mean, uh, I don't think necessarily playwrights do that. I mean, uh, and that's part of my bugbear as a reader of script is how to interpret the work so that it's an active moment in time rather than a revelation of times past. <coughs> and I think a revelation of times past can be an interesting story, but not as interesting as one where it, that you're actually living and having it roll out in front of you. At, that particular time. It's a common trope in a lot of those big American plays as well that the, 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 cr the crisis or the climax of the play is dependent on a backstory reveal, which is, I personally often find incredibly unsatisfying that, you know, that All My Sons have just got to be one of the greatest plays of the last 50 years. But that, the least good bit of that play is that you find out at the end that it's all to do with one little moment that happened, not concerned with the world that we've been living in for the It's cheating. It, it's absolutely it's cheating. It's cheating a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Because you're not demanding that that's resolved from the interaction of the people on the stage, but you know it's it's actually a, a, m a much more talented version of it was only a dream. And <laughs> yeah, it's a great sort of weave of time. In it's, I mean, it's not an indigenous writer, but it's an indigenous issue. It's the play Crow by Louis Nara, where the, 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 the main character is Crow, who uh, was played by Lydia Miller. Mm. She had, it was set in a specific time, the bombing of Darwin. Uh, in the play, her ghost father came to her and talked to her about time past, uh, who was an Irish man, so it, it, the ghost wasn't Aboriginal, it was an Irish man. And the character had this line that she said to everybody she met when she shook their hands. You are now shaking the hand of the hand of the hand, mm -hmm. of the hand that shook Napoleon's hand, <laughs> which was something that her father taught her. So sitting and watching the play, you have this, those three things of the dreaming, but the dreaming is connected to an Irish person. The, the actual bobbing of Darwin, because the, the play took place over, you know, the three days, it was three days of bobbing of Darwin. And then this harking back to Napoleon. And the last scene was Crow and her family moving off of the stage, looking at twinkling stars moving forward into time. Mm. Mm. And then you have the time in the theatre, the theatre audience are mm. actually watching it. And it was just such a nice, you felt time swaying and moving and rocking. It was, it was time as a character. Mm. We tend to talk about time as being history and present tense, but Peter, when we were talking yesterday, you, you were talking beautifully about the future. Mm. Said, oh, putting oh. It on the spot. <laughs> but you, you said, I, I, I think your words were, I'm not interested in the, in the past, I'm only interested in the present, present and the future. future. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's talking about the potential. I mean, I think that's what plays can do, mm. is it can show the, the future now. And I don't mean that in a scientific form, or, you know, science fiction form necessarily, although I don't mind a good space backpack and a faceplate. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, that's part of the, part of the well, the dreaming of theatre. You know, mm. you, you can go absolutely anywhere in time and explore it as, as effectively as if it's an event that's happening now. Right. Mm. Do, do you as playwrights, um, and uh, do you feel a an obligation to fidelity in his, when, you're, when you're looking at the past? How, how accurately do we have to portray the past? Well, I mean, for me, I mean your, your recollection of the Louis Nauer film is quite beautiful, and I think, um, I, I think the thing is theatre always, it, it, it's present tense, it should be a present tense experience happening now at a particular point in mm. time. Um, and so fidelity, fidelity is to the future, you know, to fidelity is to how, how we as a community move forward. And so 
so fidelity to literal facts is, you know, disputable anyway. I mean, I, I'm kind of, you know, authenticity is not something that we can really achieve, you know, even if you write documentary theatre. You know, it's still something that's that's an artifice at the end of the day. Mm. Um, and so the commitment has to be to the, the people in the room, in this imaginative shared space. And the Louis Nair example is a lovely one because, could be, because you know, we meet in imaginative time when, we, when the house lights go down. I mean, it's a sacred space for me. You know, it always will be. Um, because, you know, we can we can sort of drop into mythic time, archetypal time, you know, the, you know lyric time, women's time, um, cyclical time, you know, whatever. I mean, they're, they're all available. They're all part of the toolkit, mm -hmm. you know. And so fidelity is to the exchange in that room, you know, to to the... Um, the meeting place that, that, that we together provide and we bring story into that but we bring relationship and time and history and politics and you know re relationship as well so there's a lot that you're dealing with so fidelity to facts or you know um, it, it, there's obviously respect about ownership of stories and all of that I mean there's uh -huh, a whole lot okay. of protocols and you know so but that's a different discussion but then, the, I'm not sure they are a different discussion. I have a feeling they're in, entirely interwoven. So if we were to, to now be writing a play, um, well, let's, let's use a recent example that's been in Melbourne and Sydney of Corinder. Is Isaac or Andrew here? No. no. Um, are people aware of the premise of that play and the exploration of the life on the, the Aboriginal uh, estate then? outside Melbourne, um, there, there was great fidelity to, to the source material as we do that and to, to take a liberty with that, to invent a situation, to put a person in, in that world who had not lived in that world would I imagine, I can't speak for the, the authors of that, but I imagine it would have been seen as a gross transgression. Yeah, but I think, I think that speaks to um, the gentleman's re remark about our amnesia and forgetting and our unresolved history and there are stories that you know we're still discovering about ourselves mm -hmm. I mean Henry Reynolds is still trying to you know you know put on the agenda the fact that there were wars in this country you know yeah. I mean you mm -hmm. know like we, we we just you know no that didn't happen we, we are brave people who fight wars on other people's lands mm -hmm. we didn't have wars here thank you very much and so yeah. so stories that, that that come out of our history that we have denied there's a different relationship to that because that's when that facts need to be there's a redressing there's a there's a there's a, an undoing of the whitewashing so fidelity is really important in those cases to events, facts, testimony, those sorts of things. Um, but, 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 so that's one type of theatre, but there's other types of theatre as well. Of course, of course. Yeah. And, the, it's the, and, and then how do you as a writer know, know which, which camp you're living in? How do you know where to, to build your play? Hi. Sorry, I'm just going to go back to what you're talking about, the fidelity and the uh, Indonesia. Um, as an, I'll treat myself as an outsider, um, in terms of obviously culturally and uh, foreign. I, know very little about Australian culture through stories because no one seems to be wanting to talk about the past. I find it fascinating that I just don't know. You know there's very little, the right, I don't know, maybe someone can answer these questions. Why aren't you writing about the past? Just as a... Because the primary answer. sources are very... Um, the primary sources at the time were very... Were, 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 were very to use a pun, whitewash. Mm. So you would have you would have a massacre that happened, and from the perspective of the person who, from the perspective of the victims, it was yes they came in with guns and you know killed and ran us off cliffs. But from the written record, you have a primary source which says we we cleared the land and made it good for farming. History's only but, the uh, yeah. history of the winners, yeah, it's never the losers. I was very interested in the history. Yeah. 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 And I wanted that to be her words because when, as I was with the political movement at the time, um, there was people that were coming up with government worded of what that meant to be taken. You know, everyone were drunks and everyone was thing. You know, I can show you photos of 
my grandparents that would have great grandparents that would have dressed better than your parents but because they were blacks so I was deliberate in wanting to make sure and yes it was only my grandmother's words but they were the words I lived by and no one was saying that sort of stuff so I was very deliberate in putting that because I felt as, as someone who had a voice because my grandmother didn't she was considered subhuman in her papers of 1910 that I'm in a position and my mother was oppressed she was made she wasn't allowed to speak that I had to justify those women's uh, plights that they went through and no one can deny me that story because if they do then those two women don't exist so and that's what was breaking down the the, the political gender and the whitewashing of, of, of what happened. It's a choice that I've chosen with Drover's wife, the Henry Lawson adaptation that I'm doing, is that I want my grandfather's stories. That was my influence of how he was stolen and given to a South African circus, left destitute in Melbourne, nearly dead, a minister, you know, so I want to find ways that I can hook those stories. I want, I want the brutality of that time of 1893 when they did just see a black and had the right to shoot them. And that's you know. kind of what I'm talking about, the brutality of those times, whereas you see mm. a lot in, um, I guess, American Westerns, um, mm. how dire and dark the time you know, was, whereas when I watch like Australian cinema or read stories, it's very whitewashed, as in... They used to kill Irishmen in America because they were subhuman, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I want to bring it back to time too. Second, as it also yeah. relates to this question about realism and naturalism and what those words mean. Because I think the word fidelity isn't about... Um, it's not about uh, scientific... The facts are important, but we can get caught up forever in facts. Yes. The, 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 the cultural wars go on. Mm. The, 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 the word denial, I think, is, is apt because whether we're talking about climate change, whether we're talking about the, you know, the genocide of the Jews, whether we're talking about what happened in this country, we're talking about, I think fidelity is an ethical relationship and an emotional relationship with, with people or events. It's, it's, not a, um, it's not about, it's not just about it's not just about the records, because as we, as we can see, denial goes on long after the facts come out. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. The point is that things have been denied and that they go on being denied. And I, and I think, I do think Australia is extremely <coughs> denial on all, in all sorts of areas. Um, so I think, you know, that, that this question of, of, of time or realism or naturalism, you know, they're, 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 they're poetic forms too. And what matters, whether you're telling a documentary story or whether your story is telling a story that is, you're dreaming yourself, is that you're faithful to, you're, you're faithful to people or you're faithful to the images in your heart. Yeah. It's mm. not about trying to, fidelity can't be reproduced. It's not about yeah. reproduction. Yeah. Remembering is about putting things back together. It's not about replicating something. It's the difference between truth and authenticity, I think. Mm, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just nudge on ever so slightly because I think we've we only got about five minutes left. Is, is that oh, says somebody looking at their watches. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Twenty-five past women have been done. Already. Okay, great. Oh, Chair, I'd love you to talk about the time um, the, where time actually ended up dictating not just form but, uh, but genre. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this was an experiment I did um, where I was trying to write about what it feels like to live in a diaspora and. Um, just to backtrack a little bit um, and very quickly, um, when, when I was uh, young, I, I lived on the same street with all my relatives. So my cousins, my uncles, aunties, all on the same street. Then we left, we you know left by boat to come to Australia. My uncles and aunties left and went to other countries. So America, Germany, etc. Um, so then we were a diaspora. We were no longer the majority. We were in a country that the dominant language was not our language. The dominant culture was not our culture. Anyway, so I was trying to write a um, Banchung, three stories all set on the same night, but at different um, time periods and geographical locations. We put it on as a straight play, Pross Arch Auditorium. Actors were perfectly happy, audience perfectly happy. I was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I felt the form was basically saying, here's one story being told to one audience who are the same and in one time and that's not the experience of a migrant or someone living in the diaspora who's or who's you know who's been deterritorialized um, 
And so I started kind of thinking about the work as an installation performance. So you move through in small groups, so twos, ones, listening to the, um, the same stories as audio stories on your headphone. And then five, ten minutes later, someone else comes in. So while you're at the second story, which is set during the Vietnam War, during the massacre of 68, the, the, another gr group of people are coming in and listening to a funny story about, you know, the founding of the you know, tradition of making the New Year's Eve cake. And so you're, hopefully you're grieving listening to this story, but you're hearing laughter in the same space. And then, um, and so it's, it's about, how, yeah, the story being fragmented and there are multiple stories going on at the same time and for that to be a very lonely journey. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so that was an experiment. Mm -hmm. It took a long time to work mm -hmm. that out. And if I could just comment, I, I didn't see it, but, but I think what you, what's partly happening there is that there's a conversation between those times happening in that, mm -hmm. that space. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, to kind of go back to your point, it, it, like denial is about one, one person or group of people controlling the story, so it's monologic. And I, and I think the way out of it for, for, for us is, is, you know, to create conversations, um, you know, across scenes, within plays, you know, so that... that or within, even within scenes. Within scenes, scenes you know, yeah. all of that, yeah. because that breaks down that, that, those forces that, that maintain denial and monologue. Yeah. But also, I mean, that speaks to playwriting traditions as mm. old as the hills. The notion of a narrator is trying to do something inherently similar um, to, to bring... To to give you a, a different access point to a, a story that isn't, that isn't happening right now. Um, in the last two minutes, I, I just wanted to talk about posterity and whether, whether, we, whether anyone consciously writes with a sense of this being a, a document I make for the future. Nobody. No one? No, because they're not egocentric enough to believe that they're doing that. Great. They're all very humble. <laughs> yes, and a player in Australia, we use this phrase a lot about um, in a hundred years from now, really the only thing that we're going to have left will be some photographs, but the actual document of our theatre will be the script that was written at that time, and we, we use it to justify a lot of asks of people for money. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a fundamental truth, and it's the reason why, uh, you know, until technology is able to capture the smell and the sweat of a night at the theatre, um, the, the thing that we'll have uh, as this document of our time, of this collection of thoughts and concerns and passions uh, and drivers will, will be the script that, that you create for us. Um, go on, Peter. I was just want to bring up the last thing in my head is that, you know, as writers, you should be aware that you're writing music or sound as well, and therefore tempo and timelessness is something that you should be playing with as well. Mm -hmm not only with consonants but also with vowels that uh, I'm sorry Sue Ellen I didn't want to bring it to that level I apologize um, you know that you know there there are riffs and there is music within language that needs to be played with yeah even if you're writing naturalism and of course the time itself within a play affects language and that your scene at four in the morning is entirely different even if it has the same objective to a scene set at midday um, so any last curveballs you want to throw out? I think it's the thing to make is we, we can, we, we're missing the quantum physics notions of time all yeah. the time. Yeah. And, um, and, the, and the theories of wormholes, and I just see Interstellar, which is a brilliant film, no one's, no one's seen it. And it was, the objective of the picture was an astrophysicist. And it kind of just made me leap into this imaginary like, freedom of like, oh, I can do that, but I want to do it, which is play the work on. Because time is really, it's really, it, 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 time differs depending on gravity. Now, in this country, which is 50, 60,000 years, had had 50, 60,000 years of have human habitation, gravity must have changed. Mm -hmm. You know, on, on some peaks and troughs and valleys, gravity's actually changed, and so the notion of time was changed. And then Anna Tregoyle's piece yesterday, talking about ghosts and how she's creating this work about ghosts, you know, that she was talking about the notion of time slippage and, and where you're in a place and suddenly you see a historical scene right in front of you. And it's all happening around you, and then within half an hour they're gone. Yeah. But everyone's experienced the same thing. I, I, I think in theatre we can do this. We can play with time, and, and the examples you're giving are great examples. Mm -hmm. of them, so. A, a, a kind of thing I like thinking about when working with actors, I'm a director and producer, or when working with actors on stage, 
is the concept of like total ownership of time. It's like the space that we have when we're on the stage that is on the stage is being manipulated in real time and it can be stretched and pulled and just giving like giving actors as well the permission to really take the words and, and own, mm-hmm. own like have own and manipulate time even though the clock is going tick tick yeah. tick mm-hmm. but actually the, the energetic time is different mm-hmm. so i don't know if that relates to writing but i think it does i mean i think i think writers think writing. about that yeah. whether you yeah. whether you, yeah. you I mean, it's fundamental because you, as a, as a playwright, you know, you, the thing you are doing is you are crafting 90 minutes of, of people's experience. Mm-hmm. And unless you understand that it, it is a time art in which you drop someone down a rabbit hole, you, you, you know, write novels. Which mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> feels like a brilliant place for us to stop. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, share the love for our amazing <laughs>